Thank you. There we go. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Useful Flakes, the value of common tools. And I'll warn you that this isn't going to sound like a DevOps talk, uh, DevOps talk when it starts, but we're going to loop a theme back around to DevOps. So bear with me. Uh, this is me. I'm a 19-year veteran of Dev and Ops uh, workflows, leadership, and teams. I'm a startup advisor. I'm at Matthew Beckman on Twitter. Uh, and as we're about to explore, I'm an avid flint napper. Um, quick show of hands. Anyone else in here a flint napper? I wanted to look really carefully. Not a single hand went up. Anybody know what the hell flint napping is? There's like 12 hands. That's awesome. Great. Um, so this is flint napping. It's actually banging rocks together. Uh, despite being a, a cloud architect and a systems person, I actually uh, do this in my spare time. Um, going from sort of the big rock in a clockwise motion, that first thing is the rock that we hit. It, that one in particular is Novaculite, which is really easy to strike. Uh, the next thing that kind of looks like a, a brick is an abrader. We use that to sort of sand the rock down to create a good striking surface. Uh, the next two things there are uh, billets. One's an antler billet, the other's a copper billet. We use that for percussion flaking, like actually banging the rock. And then the last three things there are called flakers, and those are used for percussion, or excuse me, for pressure flaking, which is pushing on the rock to get a piece of a flake to break off. And then underneath that are several of the really crappy things that I've done as a flint napper. I'm a beginner, uh, but you can see they sort of resemble arrowheads, and some of them might even sort of make an animal nervous if you threw it at the animal really hard. Um, so this is actually a great uh, uh, GIF that you can see on the internet. GIF, GIF, don't anybody get, I know, see, I corrected myself. Um, we basically take a rock and we make these, these little strikes around it to form a preform, which we can then strike again to make our actual shape that we're trying to get off. And you'll see these sort of radial fractures. Uh, the best kinds of rock for flint napping are conchoidal, which means that they fracture in a sort of circular or radial pattern and you can make a predictive strike to get a particular shape out of it, right? So that's flint napping. That's what I like to do on the weekends. Um, <laughs> Why, why do you care? Or even, how did I even get into this, right? I don't, I don't have a background uh, in, in rock manufacture. Um, but for most of my life, I've been really interested in anthropology, and particularly paleoanthropology, and very particularly this period in Earth's history called the last glacial maximum. This is about 15,000 to 31,000 years ago, very roughly. Um, and it is probably safe to say the worst environmental disaster our species has ever witnessed. On average, global temperatures during the last gl glacial maximum were 12 degrees Celsius colder than they are today. Glaciers, not quite covered, but were uh, massively expanded across all of the continents. Uh, desertification uh, and, and massive um, uh, deforestation occurred. Uh, many, many species died out. Uh, and really, candidly, our species probably should have died out too. No one would have faulted us for sort of rolling over and dying as cold as it was. Like, it's hard for me to get out of bed. Uh, when it's 40 degrees in the morning, but this is really, really cold. Um, but our species didn't actually die out during this time. We thrived. We were one of the few species that came out of this, this winnowing period uh, sort of better off than we were when we started it. And a big part of that, of course, is our opposable thumbs. And another big part of it is this gray matter we all carry up here that's a, it's a pretty cool tool. But a really, really big part of it was the technology complex that we chose. We are, if you haven't gotten the memo, a tool-making species. If you look at human history, most of our major advancements are tied directly to advancements in the technology and the tools that we use. And so I have for many years sort of struggled or struggled or thought about or tried to riddle out how did we survive the last glacial maximum with, with rocks as our technology complex? Um, and what is it about that technology complex that is interesting? Um, it's worth noting, of course, that while we were freezing to death, we were also fighting off the literal dire wolf at our door our hunting activities were against megafauna, you know, giant sloths the size of your house, uh, cave bears, saber-toothed tigers, and that kind of stuff. The deck was stacked against us as a species. So I want to, for this part of the talk, I want you to like pull up. We all, we all had this mental idea of what tools are. You all know the tools that you use day to day for container orchestration or for CICD or whatever they are. I want you to stop thinking about those tools for a little bit. I just want you to think about tools in the abstract and think about attributes and quality of tools. And to help, I'm going to give you a couple of pictures of what our ancestors, all of our collective ancestors, used to survive this, this terrible environmental uh, disaster. These are some knives. I apologize, the picture quality isn't great. 
Uh, these are reproductions, but you know, that's a rock that is stuck onto an antler. Call that a knife. Uh, that's an ax. That's a bigger rock that's stuck into a piece of wood. Uh, that's called a burin. It's kind of a primitive drill. We can use that to winnow out things and make holes and stuff. And of course, this is a point, this might look sort of familiar. This is a Clovis point. This is sort of the zenith of the Paleolithic um, technology. Uh, this is something you'd put on the end of a spear or an arrow to actually hunt with, right? So pretty cool. Hopefully you look at these and you're like, wow, those are sort of interesting, Matthew. But there's, a, there's a one trait that I think you can all recognize. They're really crappy, right? These are not highly evolved, advanced tools. I am certain that everyone in this room has a better example of any one of those tools at their house. Many of you probably have on your person right now a single knife that would be better at, at any task you might ask it to do than those are, right? These are not highly refined, highly advanced, super durable tools. They're rocks that sort of resemble things that we would recognize as tools. But despite that really suboptimal implementation of the technology, we had an incredible results as a species. Like, this is the list of things that we did during that environmental catastrophe armed with nothing more than slightly pointed rocks, right? We were able to hunt and fish, prepare our food. We were able to prepare our food in ways that made our bodies better able to, to digest them by preparing the meat and cooking the meat. Uh, we use those tools to make other tools. We can make very good shelter that protected us from the elements. Like camping for me in, in 30 degree temperature is a non-starter and, and these people like live their day in day out in temperatures that were less than that. Um, these are the first tools that we used to explore agriculture and the sum of all of these things led to the two things in bold that you can probably accept were pretty important for us as a species. We had enough caloric intake with those crappy tools that we could start to think about subjective representation of the world and language, which by extension kind of lets us sit around here today and bitch about Mesos. Pretty cool, pretty impactful um, results from really suboptimal tools that none of us would ever think about using for an actual task today. So as I have uh, sat in my backyard, um, hitting my fingers and making myself bloody, trying to learn how to do this, this, this technology, um, I've tried to, to boil down some attributes of this technology platform that made it so successful for our, for our ancestors. And these are the four that I'm going to run with. Uh, the, the technology complex was accessible, it was flexible, it was ubiquitous, and it empowered innovation. And we're going to talk about all these real quick in a, in a Paleolithic context. So first of all, they were accessible. All members of the tribe are tool makers, right? We all grew up seeing the picture of hunter-gatherer cultures where the man is like throwing a spear and the woman is crouched over a, a bush gathering berries, right? Um, those pictures are complete bullshit. Everybody in the tribe was a hunter and a gatherer. If you were involved in the primary activity of hunting and you saw some bush, or you saw some berries, you also gathered. And if you were gathering berries and an unwary rabbit came by, guess what? You were a hunter. And this was required for our survival. If there was only one person who could make arrowheads and they died, guess what? Our species ends. So accessibility and the idea that everyone in the tool could be involved in the make and use of those tools was a absolutely key attribute of that technology complex that enabled all of us to be here today. This last one is, I think, an interesting thought exercise. I don't want to, I don't want to jump over to Kubernetes yet, but like, imagine a tool and a technology complex that you could teach your peers without using words. We hadn't evolved language as we were honing this technology. It was pointing and simple monosyllabic grunts, for lack of a better word. Very accessible technology. It's ubiquitous. Like, you might have noticed, Earth is made of rock. So you can kind of go anywhere you want on Earth and have a reasonable expectation that you can replenish your tool supplies if you're using Paleolithic tools, you're using lithic tools. This was massively important as the environment was changing. In previous areas where our species or our, our forebears had lived and hunted and had fairly rich lives, they had to move. They had to follow the herds. And the only way they were able to do that and not die out is that the tools went with them. They didn't have to carry everything they made. They could just sort of leave and go. And if the spear broke, they could get a new spear because wooden rocks are like everywhere, man. Super flexible. Any one of these tools, despite their relative crapulence, as, as they get older, as they wear down, can be retasked for other things. Again, suboptimally, but that knife, when it breaks off the horn, could be used for a spear point. We could use it as a drill. Uh, made all of those tools more reusable and more re, uh, extensible. So for a given unit of work to form the tool originally, 
you got massive lift over the lifetime of that tool. Uh, and you didn't have to have, you know, if, I, I imagine this is true for some of you, but my garage has this huge wall full of tools on it that I use like once in a while. But if I moved, I would carry all of them with me because I need all of that specialization. This last one's a little bit hard um, maybe to think about. I, I know that few of you like probably equate innovation and rocks. Um, but this is, I think, maybe the most important part of this technology complex is the act of working with this stone. This, this, the way that we form uh, lithic tools is very error driven. Uh, uh, particularly as a beginner, uh, you make a lot of mistakes. Um, you're trying to learn the right angle to strike at, the right force. Uh, force and angle is different based on the tool and the medium you're working with. Um, and and you, you screw up a lot. Um, but often, something that you're trying to do uh, goes wrong, but goes wrong in a way that's instructive. And that becomes a feedback mechanism for you for the next strike that you make. And our, and our ancestors, this was sort of our first experimentation with subjective representation. If you go back before 40,000 years ago, a rock is just a rock. We didn't have a mental model of rock in the abstract. But working with this tool complex allowed us to have that mental model, which is how we then approach everything about the rest of, of our lives, subjective representation. So in flint napping, we call accidents that you can learn from useful flakes. And that's sort of where this topic comes in uh, and the, the sort of the, the title of the talk, obviously. So these are the four characteristics that I think were so critical uh, for that technology complex to have for us to survive and thrive and become the species that we are today. So enough about flint napping. Now we're going to talk about DevOps. You can relax. Um, I, I have this bias, uh, and I think it's, it's something we'll all share, that, that in our choices and in engineering teams, we have to make trade-offs, right? Sometimes we might want the most specialized tool, the thing that is the absolute best fit for the task at hand. And sometimes we might want something very generalized that is uh, less optimal at a task level, but, but good for other reasons. Maybe we get a better volume discount on the price. And there's a tension there, right? And I think tension is very healthy for us to have in our, in our engineering teams as we explore these potential trade-offs. And my bias after 20 years is that the engineering bias here is for specialization, right? There's, there's like a saying, you've probably heard, the best tool for the job. Um, and that's great. And like we as engineers have lots of good reasons to find highly optimal, highly focused tool sets to accomplish the tasks that we're, that we're uh, trying. Uh, but what I want to spend the rest of our time talking about is really the value of common tools and the generalized tool as opposed to the, or as opposed to the specialized tool. So we're going to take these same, these same characteristics, characteristics and attributes of the technology complex of Stone and I'm going to apply them as values for us to think about in our DevOps practice. And I'm going to go in reverse order. So the first thing I want everybody to hopefully agree on is that tools should reduce us, or excuse me, relieve us from toil. It should free us from toil. If you have read the Google SRE book, there's an incredible chapter on toil and its impact on our teams. The amount of time that we spend doing simple tasks that could be automated, repetitive tasks that are error prone, uh, is bad for us culturally, bad for our brains, and bad for our productivity. The best tools are going to empower innovation by relieving us from toil. And I think that the right kind of innovation is the kind of innovation that lets you just sort of deploy the tool and forget about it and get back to your actual day job, which is focused on delivering products and features. Unless you are a SaaS company who's also selling the tool that we're talking about, very few of us are actually compensated to toil away on a tool complex. The wrong kind, of, wrong kind of innovation that specialization leads to is heavy customization, high operational touch, uh, teams are focused, toiling for the tools. And like, on the one hand, we've got a hyper-specialized tool that really fits the task at hand, but if we need to hold team around to support that tool, I don't think that it's a net win for the team. The next thing I want to invite you to consider is that tools uh, should or must enable a flow state. Our choice of tools should be one that values our ability to be in a flow state. Now, there was a great Ignite yesterday uh, that talked about recruiting as a way to interrupt your flow state. Uh, let, let's table that for a minute. Uh, but hopefully everybody kind of knows what I mean. Like, being in a flow state is being in the zone. Your headphones are on, uh, nobody's bothering you on Slack, and you have two hours, and you can jam out more stuff in that two hours than you would in the previous two days full of interruptions. And our tooling is something that can enable or hinder our ability to get into a flow state. 
The first part of that to recognize is that multitasking is a lie. Neurologically, it is a lie. It's a lie that we've all told ourselves and we all believe, and we're actually really, really good at switching between tasks, but we are not multitasking. That switching requires a, has a context, or excuse me, a cognitive cost that impairs our ability to be in a flow state. Every time you switch between Git and the AWS command line, your brain has to unload the previous context and then reload the new context. And the more you're doing that in your day, the less in a flow state you are. And the more, as you probably all know, likely you are to mistype the command that you're trying to run or to think about things in the wrong mental context. That cognitive switching is the end of your flow state. And by extension, it's the end of your productive day. So flexible tools are probably less optimal, and this is back to my, my value of flexibility in our tool set, but the payoff in reduced cognitive load is measurable and important and something that we as engineers need to value higher than optimization in our tooling. I actually hot fixed my deck, uh, thanks to Curtis's talk yesterday and, and Ken's tweet here, uh, because I thought that it was great uh, that we had the, the Deming quote that says sort of the same thing in a different way. To optimize the whole, we must sub-optimize the parts. Now, <laughs> you're engineers. This is, for me, this is almost a provocative thing to say to a group of, of people like us because we're not actually really um, rewarded when we sub-optimize things. If you uh, need to go in and increase the speed of a deployment pipeline and you come back and hand it to your manager and you're like, well, it could go a lot faster, but I, was, I saw this slide that told me to sub-optimize the parts, so, uh, you know, it's not gonna. Um, so, so, so be mindful, I think, of, of the difference there between the idea of, of sub-optimization as a bad thing uh, because of the output of what we're trying to do, but think instead that optimizing for the whole and optimizing for a flow state across your team uh, at the cost of highly specialized tools is a tension that we should explore more. So on to ubiquity. Um, bad news, we are super unlikely to find a planet made of effective CI-CD pipelines, resilient microservices, or scalable cloud computing anytime soon. So we need a different definition of ubiquity. We're not gonna be able to like tag on to what our Paleolithic ancestors did there. Um, and I wanna define ubiquity by its opposite. This is my, my favorite XKCD comic of all time. I'll shut up and let you read. At least several of you have been here. This, this, this correctly captures the 19 years of my career. Like, who, why, do, how, why, why do I have this error? Nobody else has this error, my God. Um, I think that this is like, this is one of the costs of specialization. And, and I'm, I'm very, very mindful of the adoption curve. Sometimes a tool is early in its life cycle and we need adopters to use it to suss things out. Uh, and that's fine, and we as teams have to be able to explore those sort of tool specializations. But when tools are not ubiquitous, when they're not widely adopted, you are on an island by yourself. And good luck, and you can probably figure it out. I know you're all smart people, but is that really what you're here to do? Is that really the way to best optimize your, your day? Uh, I am not actually Denver Coder 9, by the way, just to be clear. So stated differently, for us in a, in a ubiquitous DevOps tool world, the broader the base, the higher the peak your team can achieve. I think some characteristics that I, I associate with ubiquitous tooling uh, are ones that we don't really prioritize or value as engineers. Um, and there's this relationship. If you see wide adoption of a tool, it probably is relatively simple. It probably fits many workflows. We're, we're kind of getting even back to flexibility here. And probably is a very excellent UI UX. If I ask one of the developers on any of my teams to go and like put together the requirements document for a new tool set, these three things are not likely to be high on the list. Uh, that's, those are more things that like a manager might put on there. But I'm trying to encourage us as engineers to be more open to them as indicators that this tool is on its way to wide adoption or as proof points that there's been a wide adoption of this tooling. And I think ubiquity for us as DevOps teams isn't just lots of other people in the world are using it, but lots of people on our team are using it. When you have broad adoption of a technology in a team or in an industry, you have a much broader base to draw on. You have a rich community that can enable you to get the most productivity out of that platform. May be suboptimal, may not be the absolute best tool for the job, but you have novices, journeymen, and masters who can all learn from each other, who can all share and collaborate in that tooling complex in a way that specialization does not allow. So that gets me to the last one, which is accessibility. 
Um, and this is, for me, sort of a thing that I wish we talked about more in these conferences. You, you, it's a DevOps conference. You've now seen a Deming slide. You saw a slide yesterday where somebody told you to read a book. Now I've got the slide of like silo, of a, grind, a grain silo. Like we've hit the trifecta, everybody can go home. Um, but for me, the bad news here is like normally in the DevOps, uh, DevOps stage, you're going to see these, these silos labeled like front end and platform and data and network and operations, right? And we think about departmental silos as being this thing we have to break down to achieve true collaboration in our teams. And that is, that is absolutely true. But friends, tools are just as much a silo as your departmental or your, your arbitrary organizational constructs are. If I don't know how to use the tool that you're using, I cannot collaborate with you anywhere near as well as if I knew how to use the tool you were using, and vice versa. And if the, the way that I get to collaborate with your other team is by learning an entirely new tool complex, like, that is hard. That is a barrier to my adoption of that tool. It is making, it, it is making an inaccessible wall for me to climb to get to this, this idea that we have around DevOps of cross-departmental and functional uh, collaboration. So at, at the risk of being unpopular, I would submit that all members of the DevOps tribe should be using a common tool set. And that tool set should be one that, that spans across all of our disciplines so that that tool set is more accessible and we have a common language to discuss amongst our teams ways we're solving the problem, ways we're approaching a problem, and ways we're going to collaborate on a problem. And I think building that out, and, and I'm, I'm almost a little bit embarrassed to put this up here, but I, I put this up here because I know it's something that I struggled with when I was younger, and I probably still struggle with today. But we have to be really good as, as DevOps practitioners at not stigmatizing new people to our tool set. Uh, if you do some, some deep Googling, you will find at least a few posts by Matthew Beckman flaming somebody on like the Ascend users mailing list for asking a really dumb question. Um, we have all done it, and it is, it is the wrong thing to do. Uh, if we're going to have specialization in our tools, that might be okay, but the way to counter it is to not stigmatize people when they're coming into that tool set. We have to make adoption an easy thing for our team so that we can really achieve this dream of collaboration in DevOps. Those are my four values. None of them are optimization, none of them are speed, none of them are efficiency or resiliency or anything like that. They're simple values that, that stretch back, let's go ahead and call it 30,000 years, uh, that our species has benefited from. And I think that we as DevOps practitioners and as engineers can benefit widely also if we start to bring this into our conversations as an input for our, de our decision between specialization and generalization. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed a little bit of the conversation around flint napping, and maybe I've convinced you that your bias should go a little bit to the right now. Uh, but if not, I hope, if nothing else, I've given you a few new values to take home and to discuss in your teams when you're, dis when you're debating which tooling to use and whether to go down a specialized or a common tool set path. Uh, I am Matthew Beckman. That is everything I have for you today. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about flint napping, I have some really bad arrowheads you can check out afterwards. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about DevOps, you should keep coming to DevOps days. Uh, and I'll say lastly that I'm, I'm excited to say that I just joined the uh, Craftsy team as a VP of engineering. Uh, we're hiring there, and if you're interested in exploring your next career path, you can hit me up after the talk for that also. Thank you. Yeah, does anybody have any questions about flint napping or DevOps? Nice throw. We've seen some of those patterns <clears throat> or, or slightly anti-patterns or the need for some of the things you suggested, either both internally and at our customers. Uh, you made some references and you went through your slides kind of quick. Do you have your slide deck somewhere that we can get to? Yeah, sorry. The, I think the question is just will my slide deck be up sorry. somewhere? Yes. Yes, that's okay. Uh, I will tweet from that handle links to the slides. Uh, awesome. So yes. So to, to bring in another XKCD comic, how do you actually get to a state where when you try to introduce you know, this, this utopia of a nice common tool set to get to there instead of having N plus one tools where now everybody is even more split? So I, th I think the question is how do you get to that common tool set? Right, how do, you, how do you actually agree on something when there's already discord? Like what new thing can you introduce that everybody will magically now 
like and use and you know have in their flow state instead of having another thing that people disagree on? Yeah, that, it's it's probably the hardest question to answer. I don't have a simple answer to that question, and I think that I would change the way you asked the question. It it isn't that we can introduce a new thing that everybody is going to love. Not everybody is going to love the thing. I think you pick one of the things that's present in your team, and you grow it, right? And it is many, much like everything else we talk about in DevOps, we're talking about cultural change, it isn't gonna be easy, it isn't gonna happen because the executive demands it, and it isn't gonna happen because like three engineers really like it, it's a process. But I think, as, as one example from my own background, uh, uh, one company I used to work at, we used Jira, and Asana, and Basecamp, and Trello for workflow, right? Does that, does that sound familiar? Does anybody else like live in that world? It's like. Ridiculous, we literally had somebody whose job was to sort of move cards around between these systems. That's a silo, right? I can't see your workflow, you can't see mine, or I can at high cognitive switching cost and trying to remember my login to Trello, like, it, it's awful. So, so of those four workflow systems, I would argue that probably any of the four are probably good enough, and maybe one is better for everybody than all the rest, but we try and do an evaluation there that is focused on what is the, what is the greatest good that we can accomplish across the team, not the hyper-focused, localized good we can accomplish for your specific team. And once you see a little bit of success in there, uh, and, and I'll say that this, the end of the story, that team settled on JIRA and the Atlassian suite, and sure, people complain about it, but it's actually much better now because we all have transparent views into everybody's workflows, right? So it takes time and it takes buy-in, but that's for me the path, and I'm, I'm hopeful that I'm trying to give you guys, uh, you, you guys and gals a language to communicate with your teams around that, because the argument is always gonna be like, but I hate Jira, it doesn't blah, 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 right? It, they're not wrong, that, that's right, it doesn't do that, but if we actually start to value ubiquity and accessibility, uh, then maybe that's a way for you to help win that argument or persuade those people. Cite another relevant XKCD uh, where he says, uh, would you please pass the salt? And five minutes later, uh, where's the salt? He says, uh, I'm building a system to pass you arbitrary condiments. <laughs> My experience is that the engineering bias is actually on the generalized side of the spectrum, but maybe I'm thinking about it wrong, and it seems like the trade-off is generalized tools are more expensive to build and to test, and it's very easy to build something very uh, specific to a, to, a, to a use case. How do we balance that cost to generalization specialization? And then explain to me how I'm thinking about that engineering bias incorrectly. You no, know, I, I think that, that actually makes a lot of sense, particularly the way you characterized it. So the thing that I might argue back for is if we have option A, which is let's, as a team, build a tool set that's generalized and meets all of our needs. I might, if you go back to my slide, which maybe I can click back to quickly, like that's the wrong kind of innovation. And, and it depends on what you're employed in. Like if you, if you work at Fresh Tracks and the tool that you're building to be generalized is something that you as a company are selling, the high five do exactly that. But if your team is, if you're at an insurance company, um, there are probably generalized tools that are available in the market from a SaaS provider who has deployed that tool in thousands of other companies, and you can go that route. And I know that that costs money, and, and we're generally allergic to spending money in IT for good reasons, but that gets your team focused on the right things, whatever that might be, instead of focused on the act of making tools. Does that distinction kind of make sense? It, it, it becomes, for me, in some ways, a build versus buy. And it doesn't have to be buy. There could be a ubiquitous open source offering that everybody uses that's generalized. And it, it isn't perfect for your team, but if you weigh building the thing that is perfect and generalized for your team versus accepting the thing that is already built and generalized and, again, a little bit less optimal, like that's where I'd like us to land more than that. Does that make sense? Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Matthew.